It's okay. Have your um, scissors ready. Have your colors ready. Maybe mix them up a little bit. Push through them around before you cut that hole. And then just slice off that a really small fine tip because we really want to keep it as slow um, outcome as possible. So if you want to grab a cookie, we can start um, with some beginning processes. So you get to pick what color. Your white, you have more white than you have red and green. So if you want to do a full coat of white, then you would want to use your, um, you want to spread that around. So for example, in a bell, you've got the ability to, uh, I'll show you how to outline and then do what we call flooding, where you fill in the, the center. So start out with your um, frosting and kind of hold it whatever your comfort level is, you wanna kind of grab it so that you have a good ability to squeeze as you're going and start by, uh, I don't, tell me what the best, okay. So as you go, you're gonna go around the edges and you know, of course you can hold your cookie or you can put it on a plate, whatever is the easiest process. And again, your lines are, will hold the frosting that we're gonna use in the inside. You have to go back and add a little bit. That's okay. And we're going to smooth it out. So if you have a toothpick on hand, that's a great tool to use for um, spreading the inner frosting. Okay, so we're going to go around the edge. So you should have an edge started for you. And then we're going to fill in the whole thing. So this will be an example of one that we can fill in completely. Okay, and this would be flooding. So depending on how thick your icing is, some of you might have uh, thicker uh, white versus the other guys. So you can take a toothpick if you have, or you, I used a chopstick home at home last night. So you can really do anything to um, spread this out. If it's thin enough, it might actually even um, go across your whole cookie as well. And remember that edge that you created, that start line, will generally keep it in so it doesn't fall beyond that edge. So, so, so Jesse Kai is saying that you make it look so easy, it's already <laughs> covered in icing. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the fun of it, Jesse. <laughs> so a couple of historical things. So gingerbread has been around for actually a really long time. And initially it was medieval England where ginger, of course, was considered um, to preserve ginger, which is, of course, for the, um, you know, we know there's health benefits to ginger, but they were actually using ginger back in medieval times to help um, with preservatives. In fact, until not until the 15th century did we actually get it into a dessert format so it's kind of the history behind um gingerbread and again if you feel like going back into I'll, I'll bounce back and forth but if you feel like you don't have enough of your frosting in there you can always add more as you go so i think i might need to add more in there so don't hesitate to feel like you need to add more um, frosting into your shape. And again, you can straighten, your, if you feel like your lines didn't go quite enough to the edge, you can um, spread that out as well with your toothpick or chopstick, or I actually saw there was um, a group or a presentation that they did with paintbrushes. So really it's your tool of choice. You could use even a small offset spatula to help push that out. All right. So you should have a, if you did a full version, you have a full um, gingerbread. Now, royal icing is meant to get hard. It will, it will firm up so that you can actually, um, it takes a while, but it actually will become firm so that you can touch it. If we want to do some other shapes and and fun things on there. Then we can wait for this to dry a little bit and then we can add to it. So there's lots of ways that you can use your frosting to make shapes and fun things. So I'll wait for this to dry a little bit and then we can go further. All right, 
So going back to my um, history, so in um, it was cultivated in ancient ginger was in ancient China, and then they um, transferred it through the Europe got it through what we call the Silk Road, and then in the Middle Ages it was a spice disguise the taste of preserved meat. So there's a lot of um, historical purposes behind ginger. And Henry the Eighth used ginger to help reduce the amounts of, or the, increase the resistance to plague. So, hey, we're in COVID time. We ought to start eating a lot of ginger <laughs> and eat those cookies. So, okay. I'm going to so bounce back to my pre-made one. So I know that some of you may not have one that's ready to go, but I'm going to show you what we can do with layering with colors. So if you wanted to layer, and I'll show us on the wet one, but if you wanted to do a dry um, layer so that you could go on top of another with a color, you can, of course, add as you go. So start get a start point, squeeze gently. And then, of course, if you want to go across in the line or what you're going to do, figure out what your um, design will be. So if I just go across in lines, Up to the edge, so you can you go as quick and as slow as you want. It's it's not a um, a time factor. So if you wanted to layer it without having it bleed or melt into your white, you can let that firm up a bit. So I, I could even put my red um, in between as well. Okay. Now, when it's wet, that's your opportunity. If you want to put sprinkles on, or you want to put um, M and M's on, or whatever you want to decorate with, the sprinkles will attach to your wetness versus the dry. So one of the things that I was um, had a, uh, watched was if you wanted to just have your red with sprinkles, then you would let your green dry thoroughly. Then come back, do your red, and add red sprinkles, and it would stay st strictly on your red and not touch the green. So I'll um, I'll leave that for now. Now, while this is wet, one of the things I can share with you it, this is um, kind of a technique that you can drag across if you have a toothpick or you have a sharp um, item that you can use with your colors. So this creates kind of a, I want to call it a, I used it as a, my paisley variety, or as, as you drag down, you can create hearts. So we're going to you can create grid lines, you can do anything. And this is what you could pull. So when you take your cookie and you want to pull, pull down on the toothpick, we're trying to drag that frosting through this through each area, through each of our wet spots. And it, you can do as many of these and it, or as few of these as you want. And I would say drop it um, in between so that you, or dry it off in between your, your lines so that you're not dragging too much. Oh, so this was a, an M&M bell and I cut it in half. So I just sliced it in half and then Put it on there. Not, not always are your M and M's going to go as easily cut in half. They might break a bit, but if you can salvage enough to create that look, um, to create a bell bottom, you're welcome to. And again, this is almost kind of a forgiving frosting in the fact that you can move it a bit and you can move it around. I actually um, experimented last night with erasing <laughs> some issues, so you can actually pick it off if you didn't like something. You could almost take it off and pull it away. So here are some other, um, here's some other techniques that we can try. So we're going to use the, the one that was wet as well. And this is when I could use eyes. So what I did with, here was some fun things I did with the sprinkles. Remember you have colors of your sprinkles, right? So if you wanted to use any of these um, pieces as decorative, so I did, um, on a gingerbread boy, I did eyes. 
and I used it in his bow tie. I used it for the the blue under his suspenders. So whatever you want to do, you can add those um, and break them too. You don't have to keep them whole. They could be broken. With this gingerbread boy, he has um, a layered. So the dry, the white completely dried, like I talked about into this bell. The white completely dried, and I came back and did just a little bit on the red. So that, that way it doesn't bleed into the white. Um, and then for the eyes, I put just a slip of, um, or a dot of white so that you have kind of, it's kind of like glue, right? It's going to help the, the, whatever you're going to use stick, um, to its process that you're creating. So let's see what we want to do. We've got to make a scarf for the, um, gingerbread person, maybe, or some arm, arm identification so we could go back and do you know we can you can add a color you could zigzag you could do whatever you want for your arm definition on the legs so we let it dry just a little bit so it's not bleeding into it and if you get a little area where you're not happy with your color, you can add um, add a little bit back. So my white looks like it pulled off a bit. Don't hesitate to add it back. If we want to do uh, some buttons, this is where I used your M and M's, or you could use. Uh, we can do these guys. Let's do some uh, red buttons down the front, and again. Use your toothpick if you need to move it around. So we can give this gingerbread person a button. And I need another. This is where you get to have fun and pour out what you need so you find the right size. Jesse, any questions coming across? I haven't asked, I haven't asked any trivia yet. I have a trivia. Okay, I have a trivia question for everybody. Uh, you're all like really concentrating on your decoration, but I have a trivia. The gingerbread boy, right, is a, um, or the gingerbread man is a, a story. How many characters did he run across before he got eaten? Anybody know how many characters he ran? He was created by an old lady. They talk about an old lady. He, she was lonely and her husband said, I think to bake something or create something. So she baked a gingerbread boy or man. And of course she wanted to eat him for dinner and he didn't want to be eaten. So he said he, he took off and he ran away. But how many characters did he run across before he got eaten? Does anybody know? All right. Um, let's see what else we want to do. Let's go. And we'll do. Jesse Kai says seven. Uh, seven. Everybody says seven. Seven it is. <laughs> so I had another, I found another story. Of course, there's always variations, right? Of story. So one actually had a crow at the end. So the crow came by after, remember the gingerbread man is, is on the back of a fox. So he gets through the old lady. He gets past the old man that's coming after him. And then they run into a cow. He runs away from the cow. They get to a horse. Horse is ready to take off. And they get to a pig. He gets to a hen, and of course, they're all chasing him. He winds up running against, a, coming up against a fox, and the fox is the one that is his saving grace to get across this river that he wants to cross. And if he, he knows that if he jumps in the water, he's going to disintegrate and melt. So the fox says, I'll take you across. And of course, you know, he's not thinking that maybe the fox is, has ulterior motives. So he's on the fox's back, and he starts going up towards the top of his head. By the time the fox reaches, getting closer to the bank, the fox is thinking, hey, if I let this guy go, I'm not going to be able to eat him. So he says, why don't you crawl up on my snout? So he does. And one story ends there where the fox gets smart, opens his mouth, and he drops in. Then another story had a crow. So when the fox is throwing him up in the air to eat him, this crow comes by and picks him up and carries him, you know, and is, is on his way. So the gingerbread man says do you want to eat me and the crow obviously to, to talk has to open his beak and that's how the gingerbread gets away so there's one story where he actually gets away and is off on his own 
But otherwise, the traditional one that I read was that the fox gets to eat the gingerbread boy or man. So, but he always used to say, run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. So little background on some fun uh, story. Okay. How are we doing? We doing well? Anybody want to show me what you have? I, I want to see what you guys have. If you have your video open, you can share some of your creations that you've got started. And I'm I'm looking forward to those. Oh, we have a great looking bell. Kristen's got a bell. Christy. Oh, pretty star. There you go. Yeah, so you use the wet on wet technique and drug it around. That's great. So there's lots of ways to um, create all these fun visuals. And again, you can drag through your wet on wet. So I'll give my, anybody else want to share? <clears throat> You're welcome to share this whole time. We Sam, won't, what does yours look won't like? hold you back. No. <laughs> That's all right. So we are going to put some eyes on our gingerbread man. Yeah, there's a drops, question. If it drops in the, in the frosting, oh. you can still move it around. Do we have a question? Yeah. Okay. Have, have you heard of mirror icing? No, oh, that sounds really neat. Is that a silver in color or uh, somebody's got to describe that for me. That sounds really neat. Like adding gelatin to icing to have a mirror-like finish. That's new. I, I did see you can add glycerin. If you put glycerin in your frosting, it will actually make it so it doesn't get as hard. A few drops of glycerin, but I didn't see anything in regards to adding gelatin. So I'll get back to our history of gingerbread, but ge um, the royal icing, basically what it is is meringue powder. In the olden days when we didn't have meringue powder, we had egg whites. So it's a, a whisk egg white um, with vanilla and powdered sugar. So it's truly a three ingredient recipe. And for your icing that you all have at home, it was meringue powder, vanilla, water, and powdered sugar. So you can vary your um, consistencies too by adding a little bit more water. So the thinner you get it, that was as you add more water. And of course, you don't want to add much at a time, a few drops at a time, so that you get a consistency that doesn't get too runny. This guy needs a, needs a mouth. So again, you can add on to your current um, gingerbread mint. The other thing you might want to think about too is to kind of grab um, if you have any dry, because this does dry pretty quickly. So if you want to take a wet paper towel and blot off whatever might have clogged your um, cut hole. That way you can create more. And let's see, we're gonna add, I'll put some sprinkles on top of his head. Again, these are, this is your creativity on what you create. Um, it's all about what you do and all about your idea of what's fun. So you can tap. Tap while it's still a little bit wet. Oops. And if it did dry, like mine is dried in some areas, it won't it won't stick as well. So we could have, I should have you uh, do it while it was a little more wet. There we go. All right. So we have, what other shapes do some of you have? Some of you have stars. So I saw a really neat star that somebody had where you did the, the wet on wet. So this one, if you look at the, when I talk about the bleeding of color, this one did it last night and it did have some pull of the red from the crystals of sugar. So again, you might have a little bit of bleeding that happened. And that's, um, that's not an easy thing to avoid. Sometimes it's our humidity. Remember, we live in a nice humid climate. So our humidity plays a role in color and um, of these types of things that bleed a little bit more. Again, it's um, red's a tough color. 
it's one of the harder ones to um, cover and it's also a temperamental color. So it tends to be a little more um, less cooperative, I guess is a good word. All right. We have one other gingerbread boy. Okay. Another guy, let's try. What would we do? Uh, we can do a traditional. Uh, actually, I, on the. We'll make this guy with the stirrups or the not stirrups. What are the suspenders? <laughs> we can create a suspender, a guy wearing suspenders. So we're going to create the line across for his shorts. And hey, I would love to see if somebody gets creative to do some Hawaiian um, visual here. Somebody wants to try, you could try like Miley leaves or you could try a red flower. Hey, we can, we can make this short or Kelly. Someone's wondering if they can get the recipe for the gingerbread cookie. <laughs> Let's see. All right. We'll fill in our shorts. And again, pushing out to where you want to get to. And at this point, if you wanted to do sprinkles on his um, shorts, we could do that or, or the, the longer sprinkles. Okay. Because now it's nice and, and wet so that he's going to have, um, it'll stick. Kind of like when we did glitter as kids, you put it on, you shake off what's left. You can tap them Oops. if it sticks. Of course, you can wipe that off and trim up your. If you want to push your corner, the edges, make them straight. You can. Remember, this icing is pretty forgiving. All right, we'll make some suspenders on them. Just the line up. One other thing too you can think about doing is if you have, if you're worried about steadiness in your hand, you can actually do some of these things off of his, off the shape and actually put it onto a, do a test run either, or you can actually dry it because this, this icing firms up and gets to be hard. You could actually put it on a piece of wax paper lay out and create a design and then lay it on something. That's another option that you can do because it does transfer nicely after um, you it hardens. So we have um, lots of ways to use this icing. All right, this person needs a face, right? So a couple of ways you can do a, a, a traditional mouth or you can do, I need to do red for a, I could do white, either one. So we'll do a red um, mouth and I just created more like a V start. It's like we used to draw birds when we were kids. Um, kind of looks like a bird to start with. And again, if you want to press it down and get to the, get it squared. You let that firm up. I want to create some eyes for him. And this is where I use my, again, I use the um, little bit of white. You could either do it and leave it as white eyes, or you can put your um, sprinkles in. We can do a color green eyes. If you want to, you wanted to spread the white, you're worried about the white. Remember, that's kind of like your glue underneath. Toothpick works great. 
Okay. Let's give him a um, something on top of his suspenders. I'm gonna give him like a button on his suspenders. We use green M and M. So remember, putting those on while it's wet is is a good idea, just so it will stick. Uh, what else do we want to add to him? Um, we could add his. I don't know. We could do. Hands, we could do, you could do a hat kind of, you could do a, a bow tie. If you had a, um, a female, you could do a bow. Uh, the ties were, if you, do, if you think about a tie, you give yourself two triangles uh, and go from there. So if we wanted to create a bow tie on this guy, put a start in the center. This one might be good to use as a toothpick. Maybe make it X. And then we can toothpick the rest of it. It almost looks like a star on him. Okay. So he's got a, a little bit of a of a bow tie and again this is your creativity he doesn't have any cheeks yet if we want to give him cheeks or blush I'm gonna drop there uh anybody else have any fun ideas that you've created since we got our gingerbread guy going Okay, we back down into our history again. So back in the back in the day, <clears throat> the we talked about the ginger root and how it came from China, crossed over via Europe, and then Henry the Eighth used it for resisting to the plague. And today we use it because it's healthy for your um, GI system. We use nausea. People that have nausea have claimed that ginger is really helpful, whether it's going out and getting the ginger root or you get the crystallized ginger or whatever your form of ginger is. It's nice for, it's a nice herbal alternative so that you can um, help with nausea. The first known recipe for gingerbread was in 2400 BC in Greece. Chinese picked it up in the 10th century. And then in the late middle ages, the Europeans had a version. Queen Elizabeth I actually it was credited for the idea of decorating. So the gingerbread was around prior to that, but Queen Elizabeth uh, I actually had the decorating and she did it through gingerbread fairs. So these were hard, called fairings and that's how they started with um, gingerbread. And they actually transitioned. How come we have bells and we have stars and we have um, all these different cookie cutters, right? Well, it became such a popular thing that they did it with the change of seasons. And that's why now we see pumpkin bells um, of course, we see trees and stars, and we see rabbits, and we see uh, palm trees. We might see bunny. So we have co cookie cutters for all seasons, and they actually carried them over based on their um, on the seasons that they wanted to try changing things up a bit. So that's how they started out. My question, my next quiz question: Anybody know how big? With the largest gingerbread cookie ever created, how big was it? How many how many pounds was it? Anybody have a guess? I will work on a bell. Uh, and let's see where we want to do. Let's we'll try an outside edge um, bell that we're going to create some. So, what is the largest gingerbread that has ever been in the world record? Leanne says. 651 kilograms. 600. Leanne, I have it in pounds. Somebody can convert that into pounds. Leanne, I bet you could do that on your calculator. Oh, here we go. 1,435 pounds. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So actually, it was in Norway, and that was back in 2009. So actually, not too long ago. The one prior to that was in. 2006, so December 2nd, 2006, um, there was a location in Texas 
that was Smithville, Texas. I don't know if anybody's from Texas, but it was um, the Festival of Light that they did, and they or Celebration of Light. It's an annual celebration. And the 16th year they did it, they had somebody create one that was 1,308 pounds. So a little bit less than the one from Norway in 2006 or 2009. Uh, but it had 700, here's just a little bit of the specifics, 750 pounds of flour, 20 feet um, from head to toe. So this gingerbread man was 20 feet um, large. 20 feet tall. Um, he had 49 gallons of molasses used in his recipe. He had 72 dozen eggs. Okay, now I want you to think about all the eggs that you've cracked in your life. 72 dozen eggs, you have to crack them without getting shells into the, um, the mix. And this was separated eggs because of course they wanted to use, um, they had to separate the eggs. So that would be one heck of a lot of eggs to have to crack. Then they, they had to bake it, um, this particular one in Smithville. They didn't have all the specifics on the one in Norway, but they had to bake it over a dump truck uh, that was loaded with charcoal. So then they were able to hoist him up with a crane. And Smithville, Texas still has um, a, uh, a statue of, of a gingerbread man that they claim as their um, town emblem. Then, the, so you think about Texas, everything is larger in Texas, right? So where's the largest gingerbread house? Where was the largest gingerbread house ever created? So I'm gonna do my wet on wet for this one and we'll do some um, dots in there that we'll make into like a, well, we can do hearts or, whatever you wanna try. So just gonna put some dots. You go random if you want. Does anybody guess on my house? How big is our gingerbread, largest gingerbread house? 2,520. Mm -hmm. Yeah, think <laughs> about that. We have, what's our average house size in Hawaii? <laughs> Not that big. So it's 2,520 square feet. That's about the size of a tennis court. So it's pretty good size. It was built in two, uh, December 5th, 2013. And it was all in regards to a fundraiser for a children's hospital in um, Bryant, Texas, which is uh, 90 miles northwest of Houston, Texas. It had 35.8 million calories. So if you wanted to consume it, it was 30, you know, almost 40 million or 36 million calories and 23,000 sweet pieces of decorating things outside. But it was all in, in fun because they, they actually did it for St. Joseph's Hospital in Texas. So kind of a fun um, added piece there. Okay, so my wet on wet. So you can do a couple things. You can drag like I drug down on my um, on the earlier bell, or you can take it and go out of your area, take your wet to wet. So however you want to decorate and create, and I call it my paisley look. Um, but you just are dragging. And again, think about coffee places that they put coffee and cream in your coffee cup. This is how they do it. They take a dollop of whipped cream. And they put it on top and they drag something through it and they serve it to you and it looks amazing. So you can create however you want to drag those colors across. Um, general question. Yes. Um, general baking question. Why does elevation affect baking? I have never been able to understand this. And do we have to worry about this in Hawaii? Well, that's a great question. Depends on where you live in Hawaii. We have a pretty close or pretty pretty level, especially in Honolulu, as we go up like in the heights of Wahiwa, or we go up in the heights of Nuuana and Pali, those two areas are probably more at risk for elevation issues. So if you think about cooking principles and um, boiling water, I always talk about in my classes, how does water boil? Well, water boils at sea level at 212 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So as you go higher, there's less atmospheric pressure that's pushing down on that water. So you're actually gonna create water vapor and water boiling earlier at a higher elevation. So yes, 
baking and cookies and cakes can uh, be affected by elevation. And there's flour changes and there's leavening changes. And there are different things that you can adjust in recipes to reduce that problem. It really takes the skill of multiple times in creation to be able to get through that. Um, I've got friends in Denver, Colorado, they tell me that cakes baked there, you can't do them here and you can't do them here and there. So it really depends on your skill and time. It takes time, I think. Um, and there are specific, I don't have them on the top of my head right now, but there are specific things that you can um, reduce and adjust based on the elevation. So here in Hawaii, you should be pretty safe. The thing we have to deal with here is the humidity. And humidity is what is a killer for a lot of your uh, candy making and things because they rely on drying time. And if there's a lot of humidity in the air, it will affect the sugars. And the sugars are high gross topic. So they pull water in, they want water. So as we're as they sit, they pull water in and they're naturally absorbing water. And that's why we get the bleeding colors or candies that don't solidify right. So it's all more, we have to deal with uh, humidity issues more than elevation issues. Not unless you live in maybe the heights. Even then, you're probably still not seeing a significant change. Unless anybody's experienced it here on on the island, I'd be interested to hear. I do. I can tell you in Milani, where I am, I have a little bit less than boiling temperature. My boiling temperature is about 210, 211 compared to 212 down here in Honolulu. So mild difference uh, that you can adjust. And one more question. Um, mm -hmm. Any hints on how to successfully make beautiful macaroons? <sighs> I have not tried that yet, but I have um, done meringues. And so I think, and remember, this is a meringue, basically a meringue based um, frosting. So this will give you an idea of the solidifying ability of meringue. I think it's also humidity. Um, do it on a dry day. I would say get your, um, your egg whites whipped to a proper peak. There's different peaks of egg foams. And if your egg foam is too runny, it will not form, right? Then there are, if you go too far, you'll have an over-processed egg foam. So you really have to have, it's the Goldilocks principle. I always talk about that. Goldilocks principle is just right. So it might take you five times before you hit that just right technique. Um, <laughs> that's probably the best advice I can give you. I personally have not done uh, macaroons, but I know people I have um, that are here at UH, so we can we can challenge each other to try that. Same with meringues. Uh, I challenged my, my 181 class to a lemon meringue pie this year because they were asking for different options, and, and a lot of them came out with a great meringue. So it really is time. Every time you do it, you get better. So each time you make those macaroons, it gets better. Um, have a uh, something that you can measure. So for example, when you're squirting out your egg white, have a, a dot or something, um, a pattern so that you know how big it is. Consistency is also another one that you can think about is how you're going to keep it uh, uniform. So I think that's also a key. So, and then keeping them dry. Dry, um, I've actually seen people use desiccant in their candies so that they can keep the moisture. Because remember, desiccant will pull the moisture out and not make it go towards the sugar. So that will also help. So hopefully that will give somebody incentive to try a meringue uh, macaroon. I I'm with you, I'll try it as well. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. Um, any other questions that we had? Anybody other have any more designs that somebody can share? I'd love to see your designs. And I will add, <clears throat> let's get up. Oh, is Carol decorating? Do we have a knife or anything that we can, I could probably use scissors, I guess, <laughs> to cut my uh, m and m Remember I mentioned the cutting the m and m If your m and ms are whoop, room temperature, ah, squished, but I could still use the, the edge. There we go. Any other pictures, Jesse? Um, I think Sharif. might be showing. Okay. And there's, I know there's other shapes that are out there. So if anybody has a shape other than a, a bell, we'd love to see those. I do have a snowman. 
other time. We're doing good. Yeah. All right. So ginger um snowman. We got our and again, it's all in the your eyes are your own um decorator. This is all about fun, right? Enjoying what you get to do. So I can create a hat. I have to always visually another good tip. Go on to your internet and Google pictures of decorated um, cookies. That's what gives you the incentive of where you can actually put your icing and other ideas that you might um, come up with. So you can get an idea from the web of different ideas, different, um, different visuals. The other thing too, if your frosting gets too soft, you can always add powdered sugar back to it. We'll help firm it up. Uh, again, we were having fun with this frosting for all of you. It was the frosting central in lab the other day. So we enjoyed trying to create this frosting. Um, and I think it varies. Uh, I'm trying to remember if we had really humid days though too. Today's nice and dry, but again, you can, Firm it up if you felt like it was getting too runny. You can firm it up if it's too thick. Like I said, you can add some water to it. You know what is funny is that I noticed when I was making it, um, when I made this frosting in Kanyoi, it acted much different different than when we made it in the lab. Yeah. There are, there's it's truth humid. to be it's told humid about the humidity. humidity. <laughs> yeah, there is truth to be told in how we deal with humid conditions. Um, so one of the, one of the techniques I saw on, or one of the visuals I saw for this snowman is they, instead of having, of course, we don't have snow here in Hawaii, but we made it into look like snow balls, creating our gingerbread. So I'm gonna just do a, oops, an outline. And again, that flooding, the flooding technique, if you have your, if it's nice and thin, that should just like lay down itself and it will actually, in time, it can kind of flatten out. Um, but I think I'll spread it out a little bit. And again, you don't have to necessarily use more toothpicks, but if you need them, they're always um, available. Just, you could even break them or scrape off the edge. So I'll just make this, um, my edges a little bit more out. Okay, oh, that's some nice wet on wet techniques, Crystalline. Nice job. Another challenge we faced was the, the, the depth and deepness of color. So because you're dealing with um, color adding, of course, volume of color makes a difference and, and the intensity of your colors. So if you make your snowman with some, like we created, he's made out of snowballs, but he's I'm not gonna touch our All right, we're gonna smooth this guy out. I saw some very cute, clever snowmen that somebody took a round, just a round, simple round disc, put the white down as the, the base, used a marshmallow, and then he's a melting snowman. So he is, the marshmallow is his last, his, his longest surviving piece, which was his head. And so they decorated his head and they had the, the black legs and um, arms, you know, as sticks just drawn out with the, the black icing. And um, it was very clever. And, that, and then, of course, the, you know, the orange carrot nose was offset because he had melted out. So all of the and then they iced the, the marshmallow top so that he was still um, you could still see his face and his head. But again, it was. The rest was melted. So it's that melting um, snowman. 
look. Okay. What do we want to do for our, uh, let's put a green scarf on them. So we'll go in between our white. And we can do a drop down with this. So my green is thinner. As some of you might have had thinner, um, the colors were thinner. <clears throat> so we put a green scarf on them. He doesn't have any eyes yet, so we could do uh, blue. You almost need tweezers sometimes for your uh, small spots. So again, vanilla, the icing is traditionally just, it's considered a hard white icing, so it's beaten egg whites, powdered sugar, and um, vanilla. And other flavorings too. If you added other flavorings, you could definitely do that. So I'll put a um, smile on him. I'm doing this upside down, so hopefully he's looking. There we go. Uh, but in the uh, Oxford Dictionary, was the first to mention the hard icing in 1770. Early 18th century meringue-like um, products came out and it was dried in an oven. So these, again, were drying them over time. So you can let them sit. You could force them dry with a, I was reading, you could force it dry with a hairdryer. So if you wanted to go fast, you could actually put a hairdryer against some of these and it will dry quicker. Uh, you could let them sit overnight. So it depends on your timing. But then they were piping them. They didn't start piping it until the early um, 1840s. And the, the 18th century was that beginning of everything. And so the 1840s, the German, um, Germany influence of culinary began that innovation. There's a myth behind how it became called royal icing. And the myth is all around. They felt that the, um, and I saw it counter contradicted on both sides. So Victoria and Albert's wedding cake in 1840. And because they were royals, that's where they, they deemed the name royal icing. But I, I read, like I said, I read contradicting um, information on that. So I'll put a line, I'll try a little bit. We'll put a line around them. So still some fun facts on uh, royal icing. Any other what I haven't thrown any more um, trivia out there. Let's see if I got another trivia. <clears throat> How long can you store your icing? Any guess? How long will it store? If I wanted to keep it. So let's say you you had extra or you're making it um, at home. How long could I actually keep it? What's the best way to keep it? Two weeks? Question mark. Uh, if it was fresh in the in the re and actually I saw you can keep it at room temperature. Um, I would say no longer than two weeks, but then you can freeze it. So if you made a bunch, you can actually freeze it, and you can freeze it for up to two months. Put it in a Ziploc bag. Um, squeeze the air out so that you don't have any more surface air. Because remember, it's you're trying to keep the the moisture to the to the frosting, so you can actually freeze it for two months. If you created cookies and you don't want to um, give them all away yet, and you want to keep them for a couple of months, you can actually freeze them after they've dried for another um, three months, so that you can hang on to them and pull them out, let them. Room, uh, room temperature unthaw and uncovered so that you can let that frosting kind of come back to life. And that's the, the ways that you can hang on to it for a long, longer period of time. So, uh, any other questions? Which U.S. president talked about, we talked about this in our carrot group, which U.S. president He's tied into the gingerbread. The which U.S. president was part of um, the first served gingerbread? He was. He was also in our carrot group. If anybody remembers that one, 
I'll add some. Ooh, we're getting these busy. He's getting a little busy. <laughs> it looks like a gumball machine on the bottom. <laughs> The U.S. president that worked with gingerbread. His mom actually served it um, to the Marquis de Lafayette, which is French. But that U.S. president was. That's a good hit. I don't know if that helps anybody. Oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, he's one of the four founding fathers, right? He'd be a founding father, so I would think yes. I think I mean, historically, I, I have the note, but I don't know about the the people around him. Anybody no guess? It. Uh, Lyndon Johnson. Um, a little too 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 recent. Go go much further back. Think back in the early. Um, you know, they brought it over from English settlers. So it's brought over in the early part of our history of um, the nation. So that might help. And there was one. Of, there was another fun fact I was going to share Thomas with you. Jefferson, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. It's actually George Washington. George, oh, what? George Washington George again? Washington. Yeah, that's why I said he was tied into the carrots. <laughs> He was the first person to serve that was served carrot cake uh, in New York City. So his mother was responsible for serving uh, the the gingerbread here in the U.S. Interesting thing here. So they had the gingerbread cookies um, at one time were used to generate money, right? So at some point in time, they used it to create um, um particles of ways of getting people to, to buy into something. So if you think of ways that we can um, use and sway voters, where this is a political season, right? So they used to sway voters by gingerbread men and giving them, sway the voters by giving them gingerbread, um, decorated gingerbread. So <laughs> think about that in today's world, if we gave out, you know, a, a item that somebody wanted to give for the ability to sway your voters. Uh, the other thing is gingerbread houses were common in the 16th century in Germany and Brothers Grimm wrote a book. So what is that book that was a house that was 100% edible and what actually, what was that house or what was that book um, or story about that they walked in and found this house? Does anybody remember? It's a Brothers Grimm book. That's another history piece. No, no. Oh, wait. Hansel and Gretel. Yeah. So Hansel and Gretel walked in, right? They walked into the forest and they got lost and found this beautiful house of edibles. And then, of course, we know the story. Of, it's been a while since I read Hansel and Gretel, <laughs> but um, they walked into the house full of edible fun, fun things and candy. So they are another one that triggered the decorating of cookies and the whole purpose behind um, decorating cookies. Anything else, any other trivial things that anybody has or wants to share or ready to share some pictures of anything that you might have? So we do have a final. Mm -hmm. I won't take credit. Michelle did this one as, as a, or the, the uh, uh, writing. It was a joint <laughs> effort brought to you by CDAR. <laughs> Absolutely adorable. So your your possibilities are endless, everybody. Just have fun with it. Uh, enjoy the experience. All right. And we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Keep your ears open and eyes open for next plans. We've got some fun things coming up next spring. All right. Have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy New Year. <laughs>